So that's vitamin C, and then there's a whole group of B vitamins. Um, all of the B vitamins are precursors for enzyme cofactors. Vitamin C is not, but the B vitamins are. And the nomenclature of vitamins is definitely very confusing. And a lot of this arises from historical factors. And your book talks about some of them. They're kind of interesting. So people found these substances, and initially they were just giving them letter names. Vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C, etc. And then they started learning more about them and finding out that, well, some of them actually weren't vitamins, and others were so similar that they should be called basically the same thing. And so we have some older terms and some newer terms, and it's all kind of jumbled up, and we seem to be just kind of stuck with it. So if, they, if it seems confusing, you're right, it is confusing. And we, we freely admit that. Here are the preferred names for the B vitamins, and then in parentheses, alternate names. So you'll notice there's uh, B1, 2, 3. There's no B4. 5, 6, 7, B8 is also missing, and um, 10 and 11. So they, uh, they numbered the B vitamins, but then they, they took a few out because they realized, oh, wait a minute, that's not actually a vitamin. So there's some missing there. Some of these we refer to by their more scientific name, like thiamine, um, riboflavin, but then like vitamin B6 is generally called vitamin B6 rather than any of its uh, chemical names. So those are the B vitamins. Um, the B vitamins are structural, uh, are found in different structural forms, and those forms in food are precursors to enzyme cofactors. They're not the actual enzyme cofactor. But your body takes this B, B vitamin and alters it in some way, and then it becomes the active form which acts as an enzyme cofactor. Thiamine, vitamin B1. Um, the coenzyme form of this is thiamine pyrophosphate. So here's thiamine. This is what's found in your food. And this is the pyrophosphate. So it's got two phosphate groups replacing this hydroxyl group. And this is what is an active cofactor. And this um, is involved in decarboxylation of alpha keto acids. Riboflavin. Um, yes, question? Um, what links the B vitamins together? Like, why are they all B vitamins? Do they have something in common? Yes, they do. That's a good question. What, what do these vitamins have in common? What they have in common is that they are water soluble and they are precursors of enzyme cofactors. So the B vitamins are water soluble and vitamin C is water soluble. But vitamin C is different because it's not a precursor to an, being an enzyme cofactor. Well, I was just, because like you have B1, B2, B3, B5, but like what makes them all B? You know, like what do they have in common to be all B vitamins? They just, it's lumped by function. Okay. And the function is precursor to an enzyme cofactor. Okay. Yeah. Other than that, yeah, some of them are really, really different from each other. For, for vitamin B2, riboflavin, um, here's, the, here's the structure of riboflavin. Um, there are two important coenzymes that require riboflavin. And these are flavin adenine dinucleotide, or FAD, and flavin mononucleotide, FMN. And we're going to see these guys show up later when we talk about metabolism. Both of these are involved in redox reactions involving the transfer of hydrogens from one molecule to another. So they're very important in metabolism. And you can't have these cofactors without the riboflavin. So the flavin part of this coenzyme comes from the riboflavin. Niacin. Um, Another name for niacin is nicotinic acid, and that's historical. Um, they wanted to get away from that because that implies that it only comes from nicotine or that you know cigarettes might be good for you because they have vitamins in them, and, and they didn't want to, to see that. So niacin, the NI, let's see if I can do this. Come on. 
this is taking way too long for a little bit of benefit. Niacin, nicotinic acid, um, and then the IN comes from vitamin. So niacin, nicotinic acid, a vitamin. There are two forms that are found in food, um, and these forms, the, the nicotinic acid and the nicotinamide, so the difference is this one's an amide and this one's an acid, a carboxylic acid. They're both converted into the same two, two coenzymes. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, commonly known as NAD+. And you throw a phosphate on that and you get NAD, NADP+. And these guys will show up again later. And these are also involved in redox reactions. So niacin is important for those coenzymes. But we, you know, we look at the, the physical structure of this, or the chemical structure of this, niacin, is very different than the structure of, structure of riboflavin. And so these are not like our naming or our classifications in the organic chemistry section where we said, okay, these have similar structures. These do not have similar structures. They are really just based on their function. That they're needed by the body in small quantities, and your body makes them into cofactors. Uh, pentathenic acid, vitamin B5, this is found um, all over the place, very common. It is a precursor to coenzyme A, and we'll see a lot of coenzyme A as well when we talk about metabolism. Coenzyme A is used in the metabolism of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, which are the three uh, sources of nutrition. Coenzyme A is also involved in transfer of acetyl groups. The pantothenic acid is also involved in the acyl carrier protein, ACP, which um, is instrumental in fatty acid biosynthesis. So this is the structure of pantothenic acid. And if we look at it, we see this is a beta alanine, and this is pantoic acid. And so basically, they're, they're combined together. Vitamin B6 um, has three names here because it's actually three different compounds, but they are closely related. So here's pyridoxine, pyridoxal, and pyridoxamine. So this is the amine group here. This is the aldehyde group, hence the AL on its name. And this is the alcohol version, so pyridoxine. These are um, cofactors for the corresponding coenzymes shown here, which are obtained by just adding a phosphate group. And these, these coenzymes are um, important in transfer of amino groups which is needed in protein metabolism. Uh, biotin is another one, vitamin B7. We obtain this from our diet, but it's also produced by intestinal bacteria, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you may know that if you take a course of antibiotics, it not only destroys your good bac the bad bacteria that's making you sick, but it also messes up all the good bacteria that's living in your intestines. You actually want bacteria in your intestines, just the right kind. So that good, the good bacteria in your, in your intestines um, make biotin, and the rest of it you get from your food. So the free form of this um, is biologically active, which is unusual because most of these, the free form, the form that is found in the food, does not actually do anything. Your body has to alter it before it functions. But with biotin, the free form is biologically active. And what happens is um, the carboxyl group over here will bond with lysine at the enzyme's active site, and that's how it functions. It acts as a carrier for carbon dioxide. Folate is another B vitamin. There's several different forms of folate found in food. So this is what's called folic acid, and it's got a pteridine group and the paraamino benzoic acid and a glutamate molecule. 
And the difference between these forms of folate are that they have varying numbers of glutamate. Some of them have three, some of them have more. 90% have three or more glutamate groups on them. The active form of this that acts as a coenzyme is tetrahydrofolate, or THF. And if we look at this structure compared to this one, we, we understand the tetrahydro prefix on here. There's one, two, three, four hydrogens that have been added onto this pteridine part. The paramino benzoic acid has gone away, and now we've got this one glutamate group here. Uh, folate is um, very important in preventing certain birth defects. Um, cobalamin is the only vitamin that has a metal atom in it. And this is a big old messy looking molecule, isn't it? Right in here, there's cobalt. There's got a cobalt in here. There's two forms, the free form and the coenzyme form. And the difference is this guy right here. Cyanocobalamin has a cyanide group bonded to it, and methylcobalamin has a methyl group on the cobalt. <coughs> it's the only difference between the active form and the, and the form that's found uh, just free. It, this is not something you get directly from the food. It's only produced by microorganisms. Question? So antibiotics are like the bacteria side, and it's like a broad spectrum kind of one? Um, yeah, Bac uh, an antibiotic will kill bacteria. Okay. And um, it, it won't necessarily kill all bacteria. Bacteria have different levels of susceptibility to various antibiotics. But it's unusual that you could find an antibiotic to just kill the single bacteria that's making you sick. Usually there's going to be other bacteria that die as well. And so that's, you know, that's another reason to not overuse antibiotics. It used to, when I was a kid, you went to the doctor, you weren't feeling good, they would just give you a prescription just in case, right? Because they didn't understand that bacteria can mutate and form these resistant forms that the, back, the antibiotic doesn't work on anymore. And they didn't really understand then either that you have a lot of flora, good bacteria in your intestines, and you don't want to kill those off unnecessarily. You can get them back, but you can be kind of messed up for a while until you get those back. Well, you can get sick easier. You well, you can get sick easier. You can also have uh, gastrointestinal issues. Uh, you might not be absorbing the nutrients from your food. Um, you know, you kill off the one that makes cobalamin, then you could get a vitamin B12 deficiency. And, and so now, you know, it's very common to hear, you know, people taking probiotics. Yeah, you're eating bacteria intentionally, but they're the forms that are good. Or yogurt with active cultures, okay, it's got bacteria in it, but it's good bacteria. Not all bacteria is bad for you. Yeah, it's a good question. So summary of these B vitamins. The B vitamins, like I said, are precursors for coenzymes. So the vitamin B containing coenzymes serve as temporary carriers of atoms or functional groups. And these generally are in um, redox reactions and group transfer reactions. Several of these have been like an acetyl group transfer or an amino group transfer or an oxidation reduction reaction. So here we have our picture. This reminds me of a purple whale. Kind of looks like a whale. Um, so we've got the enzyme with its active site here. The substrate doesn't fit directly into the active site by itself. It needs a ride. And so the coenzyme goes in there and then the substrate fits. And what's cool about these is that coenzyme goes in and allows that particular substrate to fit in the active site, and then the coenzyme leaves again. And so that coenzyme can be used in many different enzymes, and the enzymes can also sometimes function with different substrates depending on what coenzyme comes in. And so that, that reduces the quantity of B vitamins that are needed 
you don't need um, a B vitamin molecule for every enzyme molecule because they can do double, triple, whatever duty. They can, they can work with different things. So it's kind of cool. Um, here's a helpful table. I forgot to change the table number. Sorry about that. Publishers. I understand them having different versions of the book. But good grief. Could you just fix those? It's table 11. Um, so listing out the B vitamins, what the coenzymes are that are formed from them. And these are the different groups that they um, help to transfer. There's another table in there which you might be interested in that shows the B vitamins and the different food sources of them.